It's going to be an illustration challenge in today's episode of Our That Place in Praise. The question is, how much clutter and detail can you draw in a page? And my answer is, as much as you can possibly paint. This is the reference photo I use in my watercolor painting, and I'll bring you through the streets of Kuala Lumpur to show you exactly where that place is. As an illustrator, there are times you'll be asked to include many details in a page, and, and if you're working with watercolor, that can be tricky. You know, to, to paint that as compared to medium like colored pencils or pen and ink where the tips are pointy and you have better control of the flow of pigments. So in this video, I'll give you tips and tricks in making this type of illustration challenge a wee bit easier to handle. Some of my tips may be too simple for seasoned artists, but I'm making this video as beginner friendly as possible. Now, during my trip to Malaysia, I saw many places that can be called uh, an urban sketcher's dream. There were a lot of exotic food and places that are unique to Asia that would be perfect subjects for a painting. And so as we drive down the streets, I'll bring you to this open space restaurant where the dining area sits side by side with the kitchen. Um, the ambiance is not something you'll probably appreciate, but I, I tell you, the food is so flavorful. It haunted my memory to this day. And all that clutter on the floor makes this the perfect urban sketching project. There were actually so many spots in this restaurant that I wanted to illustrate. I, I, I couldn't decide if I liked the spread of food more or maybe the paint the chefs working in the kitchen. In the end, I just decided to work on as much of the panoramic view as I can fit in my 8.5 by 11 sketchbook. If you've been in my channel long enough, you might have noticed that my watercolor set is often dirty because I constantly dip my brush directly on the pigments instead of mixing paints in a palette. I tend to be lazy at times and mix on the paint set directly to make my work move quickly. But today, I'll show you the mixing tray I use occasionally to give you a painting tip. You see, it's not often talked about, maybe because it's assumed that artists should know this already. But if you're a beginner, you might wonder, what's the difference between a plastic and a porcelain palette? Like, which one is better? I'd say that once you've tried a ceramic or porcelain palette, you'd never want to mix paints on anything else. It's easier to use, and when you're working on a detailed painting challenge like this, anything that can make the workflow more easily is a welcome change. Plastic palettes smear even after first use. So if you're OC and want your supplies to always be spick and span, that fact can be an issue. Porcelain pla palettes, on the other hand, are easy to clean. Even with uh, dried up paints, uh, a quick water rinse can remove those stains in a jiffy. If cleanup isn't a deal breaker for you, maybe mixing is. Like with pa plastic palettes, water and paints beat up. The, co the cohesion of the mixture is strong on a plastic surface uh, such that you'll, be, you'll see separate tiny beads of paints on the palette instead of one big puddle. And that can be annoying when you're trying to mix. It looks like um, droplets of rain on a highly repellent jacket. The liquids keep pulling apart even if you swish your brush around and mix them together. Aside from the, the annoyance, um, this becomes an issue when you can't really see the color values you're creating because the pigments are just not mixing well. Uh, this is, um, I don't think this is much of a problem with ceramic palettes. Although sometimes you'll see some droplets of mixture separating from the pool, but it's not as rampant as when you use a plastic palette or a metal one. Now, you don't have to buy a ceramic well palette like mine to, to make your mixtures. Any porcelain will do. Actually, you can 
pull out your dinner plate from from your china cabinet or maybe use your porcelain coasters or soap dishes or ramekins they'll do the trick as well the point is when you're working with a painting with which has a higher degree of difficulty like this one i'm making you'll want to use the right tools to ease up and speed up the process so that's just my two cents worth of tip with regards to palette choices and i'm talking largely in terms of watercolor if you're using oil or acrylic it doesn't matter whether or not you use a ceramic or plastic or maybe a wood palette i myself just used the plastic lid of a disposable takeaway container nothing fancy about and there's nothing fancy about it but it does the job pretty much okay when uh, painting a complicated scene like this you'd want to have more control of the uh, movements of the paint especially as you uh, navigate through the teeny tiny sections of the drawing so i want to talk about how i hold my brush if you haven't noticed already i position my fingers right at the metal ferrule the more detailed painting a painting is uh, the closer you should move your fingers towards the bristles to go to give you better control it's it's like holding a pencil you need precision so you can't let the brush swivel or whip back and forth in huge increments you can steady the brush better in your hand when you you don't hold it at the far end of the handle you stay at the ferrule and, and i'm saying this because this is not a loose type of painting in this project i want my edges to be crisp I, I want the lines to be well defined and the painting to lean more towards realism than impressionism. I don't want pigments to flow out randomly to create cauliflowers and runoffs here and there. And, and since in this illustration challenge, I'm not going to paint loosely as I said, that also means that I'll use very little water. Uh, pigments will bleed from one boundary to the next if i soak up my paper or or my brushes with large volumes of water and that's not the look i'm going for so i'm going easy on the liquids here uh, you might say i'm treating this watercolor like acrylic and i'd, I'd say yeah you're right at this point i want to talk about brushes you know, when it comes to watercolor, I, I admit I'm a brush snob. I only use premium quality brushes that I know will do the uh, job right. I lean towards authentic uh, Kolinsky Red Sable brushes like Da Vinci because the bristles can maintain a sharp point and can soak up a, a good volume of water and pigments. The liquid capacity of the bristles is so amazing. It makes you wonder if there's a built-in cistern in there. The bristles themselves look splayed out when dry, but, but once wet, the sable converges to form a fine tip. The only problem is that uh, German-made Da Vinci brushes are so expensive. You know, investing in one is enough for the budget-conscious artist and you have to treat it with utmost respect knowing that an animal was used to get the brushes to your hands besides da vinci maestro brushes or uh, their blue squirrel quills i i like escoda prado signature brushes as well um, they're handcrafted in barcelona spain S surprisingly these brushes are synthetic uh, which fit those of you who may be animal advocates and you want to avoid the animal hair uh, in products as much as possible. But the bristles were made to mimic sable and so these brushes can load up tons of pigments just as well as the Da Vinci. The Skoda also holds a pretty good point and has a good spring. Uh, by the way, if you don't understand what the term spring or snap 
means in the world of paint brushes. It just refers to the ability of the bristles to go back to its original shape. So each time you're applying paint and you're tapping the bristles down on the paper, the bristles should be able to bounce back and not stay deformed or bent out of shape or limp. You know, a good brush with a good snap allows you better control while painting. And for a highly detailed subject such as this one, that characteristic is pretty important. Now, now I'm talking about um, I'm talking about brushes, not to promote or convince you to consider the brands I use. Um, my point is that is that when working with highly detailed paintings where each section you need to color is too tiny, it's best to use an exceptional brush that can handle the micro job. You need precision brushes that won't accidentally splatter paint in portions you don't want to be painted. Now, Escoda and Da Vinci are great for these kinds of projects, but so are other cheaper brushes like Princeton or Windsor, Windsor & Newton. So you just need to look for that set of watercolor brushes that are ideal for you. But, but know before going into a painting challenge that the right kind of brushes makes all the difference in employing your painting techniques. Sometimes working on too many details can be tiring. Honestly, my fingers felt so stiff because I had to keep it steady for the most part. When that happens, I just step back and leave the painting for a while. Then I jump back in with a rigor brush that can handle all those tiny lines and tight spaces in the drawing. A rigor brush is really helpful. Uh, the brush, the bristles are longer and uh, it's compared to a round brush, I mean, uh, but the diameter is a bit smaller. And the tip only has a few pointy bristles, but they're very effective in dispensing pigments on the paper. With a rigor, you can paint lines as thin as those made with Sakura Pigma Micron pens, like a 0.2 millimeter to 0.5 millimeter thin strokes. This rigor is what I'm now using to paint this word tiger, and that's also what I'll use to write the Chinese characters and the fine lines on the electric fans and the baskets and many other tiny parts in this uh, drawing. Many artists are fine with just using flats or round brushes, but there are actually tons of brushes that are worth exploring, like the filbert, the cat's tongue, uh, the fan and angle shaders, and this rigor is one of those tools that are most helpful when you're doing a highly detailed painting. It's worth keeping at least one in your start in your uh, toolbox in your art stash. Uh, well, in case you're wondering, in this video I'm using a size two rigor, although I also have a size four, which is not much bigger than this. Okay. Now, I want to share a painting technique that you can apply in any watercolor project you have. How do you paint skin? Like, I mean, people's skin. I'll be honest with you, painting people isn't my strongest suit. I find it extra hard to paint skin. And, and if you have a limited watercolor palette that doesn't already ha have a skin tone, You'll, you'll have to know, you'll have to learn how to mix your existing paints to come up with a decent shade. I'll share with you how I do mine, which you might find really weird. <laughs> Skin for me should be a balance between warm and cool colors. So I lay down orange on top of a light blue color. So paint sets don't always have light blue so I mix any blue I find here and I put tons of white just to get that cool tone and when that's done I add in some white to lighten the skin if the person I'm painting is somewhat fair or I add a brown to darken the skin so I just go in again and again to achieve the right balance between these four colors so four colors would be blue orange white and brown and, and I sometimes use two types of brown a light brown and a dark brown 
Now, if the person looks like an alien because it's too blue, I top the skin with orange. And on the other hand, if the skin becomes too warm, like it's too orange, then I brush a tiny bit of blue in there to balance it off. So it's a delicate tango. And, and sometimes, especially for the ladies, I, I add a bit of blush on the cheeks. So I create a pink mixture by blending white with a touch of red. And with that pink, I can give some people in my painting a rosy glow, but not too much though. I, I don't want to make the person look like she has allergies. So yeah, painting skin is a bit, a tiny bit complicated for me. If you have a better way of doing it, I want to hear about it. So leave me a comment down there in the, in the box, okay? Alright friends, just to wrap up everything, let me summarize the tips I just shared with you uh, in this video. When working with a highly detailed illustration uh, where portions of the drawing are too small, you, you have to use the right tools to make the work easier for you. I recommend that you use a porcelain palette to ease up your mixing. Use a reliable, high-quality watercolor brush that can maintain a sharp point and a brush that has a good snap. Hold the brush at the ferrule to give you more control and stability. And use little water only to keep pigments from running off ac accidentally into places you don't want to be painted with that color. And lastly, 
use a rigor brush to help you with fine lines and to help you color those tight spaces which a round brush can't reach. All right, friends, thanks for watching this episode of Art That Place and Praise. And this is Ginger again. God bless you and have fun creating. Music